is wide angle underwater photography. Um, so just looking at the list, I think most of you guys have joined a previous uh, uh, sessions. Um, so a lot of the topics that we talked about should be familiar to you. So this is my, my model for how to make a killer shot, which is basically a combination of beauty, story, and surprise. Uh, and all that's only possible if you are ready to take that shot. Um, this is something from the framing. So framing it by the rule of thirds, uh, having the animal look into the picture, leaving some negative space to make it three-dimensional. Those are some of those topics. If you weren't in those sessions, I suggest to check out uh, session one and two of this series. Um, we also talked about diagonals. Uh, we talked about what makes a story, what kind of things, animal behavior, habitat, mating, hunting, and human interaction. Those are all topics, particularly in wide angle, that help you make a photo come to life. Here's an example of storytelling. You have the diver, you have a wreck, you have animals that live in the wreck, and therefore you've got very many story elements in that photo. Then we talked about technically surprising, what can be surprising elements such as arrangement, angle, lighting, framing, technical aspects, or anything that is new. So here's an example for a wide angle photo where the angle is interesting, so shooting down. But um, we are gonna talk about some of these today. For example, a sunburst. So not only do we have this super funny looking uh, uh, freshwater turtle here, but it is also a sunburst in the back and sun rays. Splits is another one that I get asked a lot about, so I'll share a little bit of my thoughts about that today. And slow shutter is another technique that allows you to get quite interesting dynamics into your photos. So I will be covering that as well. Um, a couple of topics we uh, touched in uh, session two, uh, as well as in the macro part, is the differentiation between ambient light and subject light. Super important. If you don't distinguish the two, if you don't separate the two, you will not be able to take good photos. Uh, also uh, talked about manual mode, make sure that you're always in manual mode, that you know what these three are, what aperture, shutter speed, and ISO can do for you, um, and uh, the kind of primary and secondary effect that you can achieve with these. So I'm not going to go in detail on this, but you remember these elements are very important. And if you didn't watch that part, please uh, just watch it on YouTube. So uh, I first want to start with the mindset. So a couple of things that are kind of like uh, behavioral things that I noticed in the past when uh, watching some of my guests that come on trips with me, uh, uh, having troubles getting the shot, maybe like I sometimes get the shot. Um, and uh, essentially that comes back to the killer shot mentality, um, trying to provide, uh, making a photo really look fantastic, um, uh, allowing the viewer or making it interesting for the viewer to look at it for a longer time. That is a killer shot. Those were the three things that I talked about earlier. Um, and that mindset is essentially not to just capture uh, a picture of a manta ray and for this example, but what you want to have is an amazing photo of the manta ray. So you shouldn't be just celebrating and being all super happy that you've got a photograph uh, of this animal. No, you should always think about how can I make a perfect photo of this animal? Um, and that will help you get uh, to a higher level. Now here are four things that I want to just point out a little bit more. One is knowledge. Um, knowledge essentially is knowing your subject. And often I find that people uh, don't take the time to just understand the animal uh, in advance of meeting it underwater and therefore miss out on a great photo opportunity. So the more you can learn about your subject, the better your photos will be. If you already know what the behavior might be, then you will recognize it underwater and you will find it easier to capture it. Um, the other one is patience. You have to wait for certain situations to happen. In many cases, that might take the entire dive or you have to come back and do that photo. Again, we can't always do that, but I do find that very often we have great situations and people just keep moving on way too quick, not giving themselves the time to capture that amazing um, photo. Another one is endurance. You just have to sometimes swim hard and uh, 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 swim into the right area um, and just be there where the animal will be and not where you are right now. Uh, a good friend of mine uh, who's been diving with me for many years, Jeff, just uh, pointed that out to me the other day. It was just like, this was the first thing he learned from me when you know, he was just a buddy who came on one of my trips and we did the, the, the spawn in, in, in Palau. And he said, that was the first thing I ever learned from you in photography that you have to swim 
to get to the right shot. You have to work for it. The animals are not on a conveyor belt coming right in front of you. You have to work for them. So make sure that you keep that in mind that, you know, you're not just seeing it and letting it happen. You have to swim into the right area and work hard to be there with them. And finally, the last one I want to mention is cooperation, which is a very rare moment when that happens is when you meet a cooperative individual animal that just allows you to do more photos. And I'll talk about that a bit more in a moment. So first of all, knowledge. So here we've got a wobbegong shark. And, you know, uh, when we see those wobbegong shark the first time, often people just shoot, 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 and that's it. But what you think about is what you already know. You already know that this is an ambush predator who likes to uh, uh, masquerade himself as the reef and would likes to uh, hide away in the reef. So if you think about this in advance of actually seeing your first Wobbegong in Raja Ampan, then you can immediately take photos such as this, where I tried anyway to show how that Wobbegong blends into the reef. And that is based on knowing that the animal does this on purpose and trying to bring that into my photo. Here's another example. I've only ever seen the marine iguana once, but I had this feeling that I was not going to get close enough to a small animal. So I did looked at lots of YouTube videos and I saw that these animals are actually not that big. So a marine iguana is maybe this long and quite skinny. So um, going in with a fish eye, I thought was not going to be a good idea. So I had my 35 millimeter lens on, which I thought would help me get the feeding behavior, which is what we're looking at here much better. And I can tell you, this is a super difficult dive. It is not very deep. It's ice cold, 15 degrees water, and you're like in this surge. And these marine iguanas just claw onto the uh, rocks and eat this algae. But um, I was kind of ready for this kind of photography because I had been watching a lot of uh, uh, other photos. I've been reading up on it. So I was prepared for this photo and I actually chose a different lens than most other people, which is more of a close-up lens, which allowed me to get a photo like this, which I'm very happy with. You can actually see the marine iguana. I mean, the head is literally like this big, right? And so to, to see the marine iguana snap up food, um, I chose a, a, a lens that didn't allow me to capture the whole animal. That was the downside. But I only had one dive and I thought, okay, this is going to allow me to capture the details. And I mean, look how amazing uh, the details are on this marine iguana, like this amazing Godzilla mohawk that it has and how it like, you know, uh, uh, goes over into the skin. I mean, I think it's amazing detail. I'm very happy with this choice that I made here. This is another thing that I only saw this year for the first time. I knew it was there, but I've never seen it before. These are the hunting mobula rays, also in Raja Ampan. And if you already know what's going to happen, which is the mobulas are going to dive into the cloud eventually, then you can be smarter about how you position yourself and you're going to get better photographs. Um, so try to learn about your subjects in advance. Um, good way to do that is to be all over Facebook. I literally got like all these Facebook groups that I'm a member of. There are fish ID pages. There are tons of shark uh, uh, groups. Um, there's obviously insider divers. If you're not a member yet of our community, uh, then please join because that's where we share a lot of interesting knowledge. You can read books. I've ordered lots of books uh, over the years um, and you can just inform yourself and then you will know better what animal you're encountering and what these animals might be doing while you are there. And so you may take much better photos of them. The second one is patience. So this is a famous uh, spot here, also in Rajampa. Sorry, this is one of my recent trips. So there's more photos of Rajampa in here. Um, but this is a, um, a school of, um, of snappers, which are at 36 meters uh, in Cree, um, Cape Cree in Rajampa. And if you just go down there and take a photograph, then they are going to be all messy. So what you need to do really is go in front of them and then really stay down there and wait until they calm down and make formation for you. And you can see here, I've got the entire uh, group of snappers as well as these humpback snappers in the back, all nicely facing me or semi facing me so that I get them all in the picture. That takes time. <clears throat> So I used up pretty much all of my um, uh, bottom time on this shot. And then I went from 36 meters straight up to, well, slowly, but I went directly up to 10 meters. And after that, I had no more time in the depth. But I used it all up for this shot, but 
I then got this photograph. So have patience, um, relax, make sure that the animals have time to get used to you. In that particular situation, I laid on the, on the seafloor, there's quite a lot of current, which is why they're facing you, but that means you have to be really solid on the ground, not kick up sand, and then they will relax and start looking at you. So give them some time to get used to you. Um, wait if it's a good situation. Like with these mobular rays um, that I showed earlier, I spent a lot of time there. I had my twins with me uh, on the side mount and I just waited uh, for it to happen. Um, and then uh, you will get this photograph. So if you notice that it's a special situation, make sure you stay on it. Uh, tell your buddy, nope, we're staying here and we're gonna watch this happen um, because that's sometimes necessary to get that best photograph. So wait for the development of the situation, wait for the action to happen, you will get the good photo. And finally, anticipate where the action will be. So particularly with our friends, the sharks, that is super re really important that you look where those sharks will be heading eventually. So this is a really uh, great spot uh, in Rajdu Atoll in the Maldives, the cleaning station, and there's a great ledge where everybody can sit. You can see here in the back, everybody's lined up. You can see the whole reef top is lined up. But I noticed uh, when I was there the first time that there is a little ledge to the side and the sharks basically swim by all the divers and then they swim by this bottom ledge. So I went down there, um, I took a couple people with me and then we were right there in the spot where the sharks just swim right at you. And uh, with an added bonus, you have all the divers in the back there as an additional sort of element for your story. So if you anticipate where the shark will be, you will get much better photographs. So you kind of look where the shark is swimming and then you wanna swim to where that shark will be eventually. And then once you've decided on your angle and I put here the light in there, um, then that is what your setting will be and you anticipate, okay, he's gonna be swimming in, he'll be coming in from there. So I'm gonna set my camera and my strobe and everything to be facing the animal when he comes. That means when he's now swimming around me, he's on the other side, I can't keep following and keep shooting. I have to commit to this one direction and stick with it. So uh, I find quite often that uh, uh, people give me this feedback that on uh, when we're on the trips with the animals, it seems always that Simon's always in the right spot. That is because of course, maybe I have a bit more experience than others, but also I swim a lot. So uh, you can see here, this is in Tubataha. Philippe took this photo. He's uh, normally joining our sessions, not today. I thought he would find it funny if I use this photo. Uh, but you can see also that I'm wearing free dive fins um, uh, that allow me to swim faster and get to the right position. And uh, very often I get this feedback where people find that I am in place and, and most others aren't yet. Um, and that is mostly because I swim to anticipate where the uh, animal is going to end up. And I can only uh, recommend that you do the same. So now we come to the best moments, like my highlights in my uh, underwater photography time is when you meet a cooperative subject. So an animal that does not mind you. Um, and this was actually the same dive as um, the uh, marine iguanas uh, in Galapagos. And there is very uh, cold water there. So this is one of the special things about Galapagos. So this one side uh, on Isabella Island is where the Humboldt current hits the uh, islands. And the water is super, super cold. And that's where the northernmost penguins live. These are the Galapagos penguins endemic to Galapagos. And they're normally quite skittish, but these two, or there were actually three, they were really, really interested. And they came around and they zipped around us. And, um, and most people just swam straight off for the marine iguanas. But I was like, wow, this is unique that you actually get a penguin underwater interacting with you. So I spent, you know, probably 10 minutes just shooting these guys, although, you know, my big dream, the marine iguanas were also there. But I thought, you know, this is a special situation when you've got some animals that are actually cooperative. And so I finally got this photo where I actually got a, a prize and don't remember which uh, award, but I actually got, um, actually twice, I think I won something with it, an honorable mention and a second place or something. But this is a photograph that's a result of a cooperative subject. Another example are these Mora eels in, um, in the Maldives, aquarium dive, if you've never done it, it's an amazing place. Uh, it's basically below a fish factory. So the discarded fish uh, nourish this entire 
uh, uh, army of moray eels. Uh, I'm not recommending that you do that, but the guide here knows these uh, animals that well that he actually touched them or stroked them. And um, yeah, uh, these animals, if you have such situations, you can knock yourself out and really try all kinds of techniques. So here are some photos that you will never, uh, or you will find a hard time getting more eels to cooperate like this. So you can get a super close focus, uh, a wide angle shot of such a large honeycomb moray eel. That is the kind of thing that you can shoot here or here you have another one where I've got this whole beautiful background with um, the trigger, the, the red tooth trigger fish swimming in the top and the sunburst. That's because I've got time and this animal is cooperative. Um, this was another situation in Chinchorro Banks in Mexico. Uh, normally these uh, crocs come in and they don't stay very long, but this one was there for entire six hours. It was just me and one friend uh, diving there. So we had this croc to ourselves and that meant I could take all the, the photos that I wanted, you know, the standard toothy grin, crocodile shot, perfectly lit, everything. I could set that up, but you know, that animal was so cool that I even got my macro lens out and took like macro shots of this crocodile, you know, the bubbles coming out of the nose and the teeth reflecting in the surface. All of that I could do because this was in a cooperative subject. So my recommendation, guys, is if you get that sense, wow, this is an animal that is not minding my presence. Um, this is an animal that, you know, lets me take photos, stay with that animal and take as many photos as you can possibly can and try all kinds of things out of the book, all creative techniques that you can think of, because that's a rare opportunity. Those moments don't happen very often. So if you encounter a creative uh, cooperative subject, still remain calm, make sure you don't scare that amazing moment away, stay on the subject, like just forget the rest of the dive and just stick with this animal. It was not a situation that's going to come back. So trust me on that. You want to stay with the animal and also let the situation develop. Give the animal some space, see what they do, um, and, uh, and, and just uh, give the animal some time to create scenes that you can then capture in your photography. And finally, I'm going to say one more time what I find super important that is just the most important thing ever is being ready. This is a, um, a Napoleon Brass. I've shown this photo many times, one of my favorite photos. Um, and this is a photo where you have a Napoleon Brass eating an octopus. So you have the octopus tentacles still sticking out of the mouth. And I've got my entire dive crew that was diving with me there in the back. Uh, and information. It's a perfect photo. Nobody else got any photos of this uh, Napoleon, but I did. And it's nicely lit and everything. That's because I'm ready for the shot. That means I have taken my test shots. I know what I want to do. And I am doing, getting myself ready while I'm swimming to where the Napoleon is going. Not after him, but where he's going. See, everybody else is really far away. So um, uh, this puts it all together. What I'm trying to say here is be ready to be in the right spot with the settings and your strobes and everything right so you can take one of these killer shots. This is another example from the Murray eels there. Um, I wanted to get like a Murray eel in motion and that's just something where you just have to be quick and quick is only if you're practiced and if you're ready to take photography. Yeah. So uh, this is what I wanted to say on mindset, uh, knowledge, patience, endurance, cooperation, and finally, uh, always being ready so that you can make that great photo happen. Just going to have a look. Any questions here? No? Well, if you guys have questions, please pop them in here anytime. Um, I will try to answer them as we go. So I did actually do a full talk at ADEX. I don't know if you guys saw that about modeling, and I'm just waiting for uh, ADEX to officially be done, and then I will upload that one also for you guys. Um, but I'm going to take a couple of things because for wide angle photography, super important. So if you are interested, you can find this on ADEX and in, I don't know when, in a month or something, I will upload it as well um, on the YouTube channel, which is a whole session about how to make people look good underwater. Um, and um, um, I'm just going to give a couple of excerpts about um, um, model photography and how to make people look good underwater. Uh, Karen, thank you for your question about uh, diving in Hong Kong. I have to make a separate session. Well, that's a very good idea. Maybe I'll do that, um, doing a session about um, uh, diving and photographing in Hong Kong. 
Uh, Thomas, I will get back to your question uh, about the Napoleon shot. I have a part later about strobes, so I will get back to your question. All right, so modeling. Um, one thing that I always want to remind everybody is most wide angle photos are better when there's somebody in it because it gives us this extra layer of storytelling. Um, and I think it's something to keep in mind because you're always diving with a buddy and your buddy can always be a model. Even if you're both photographers, you can model for each other and create much better photography. So keep that in mind that if you can try to add a model to the photography because they can help you add scale, make the size of something like this wreck in bikini uh, look uh, really, really large, right? Uh, also this reef into Bataha just looks better when you have a human there because that shows you how large uh, these uh, uh, staghorn coral fields are um, in, in Tubataha. You can also emphasize size so you can overdo it as in putting the model further away than the subject, making the subject look huge and then the human look tiny. I mean, these are giant uh, oceanic manta rays in, in Socorro, but they're not ja that giant, but it looks great when you have a small diver there in the back making the animal look large. It also adds a human factor. It makes this bonding between human and nature really clear. It can also really enrich a picture. Here's a, a picture from the bridge from the Fujikawa Maru in, in Truck Lagoon without a diver and with a diver. And you can see in, in my eyes, it's, it's, um, uh, it's a much better sense of exploration when you have the human in the picture. So um, that's why I like humans in there. It also helps you tell the story. You know, I'm really, really, <laughs> I really find that very important telling a story in, in your photography. And uh, with a human, you can much easier tell a story. So here we've actually got a human manta ray interaction in Socorro, but very often it's just enough to have the person in there. Right? You have to distinguish two kinds of um, things, uh, sorry, two kinds of model photography. So one is where you have the uh, model far away uh, and just as a silhouette. And the other one is where the model is close to the subject and is in a way part of the subject or is the subject. Yeah? In the left side, uh, so in the uh, silhouette only, all we need to care about is body position. And in the close-up setup, we have to actually think about what we're going to do with the face uh, in terms of expressions, but also how are we going to light up that face. Um, and those are the two different things that you need to distinguish. So when you do silhouetting, it's really important that the body is right. So you can see here, my model is perfectly aligned and he's even holding the camera down so that we can see the photographer, you can see the tank. It's a perfect silhouette shot. Um, and I don't know if you noticed this, but Fish Rock Cave here in Eastern Australia, um, uh, it actually looks a bit like a heart shape. Um, so that's why it turned out really, really nice. So where should the model be? Now here's a picture of the largest tiger shark I've ever seen, almost six meters in Hawaii. And uh, unfortunately this tiny model, uh, she's only 150 or something uh, uh, tall, but she is right between me and the tiger shark, making her look huge and the tiger shark small. In comparison, this is a picture of the smallest tiger shark I've ever seen. This is a less than two meter uh, juvenile tiger shark in Bikini Atoll. And he is between me and, this is not really a model because he's not facing me, but um, between me and my dive buddy. Um, and you can see that now the tiger shark looks much bigger than the model, although this is a much smaller tiger shark. So making sure that the model is behind your subject is super crucial because that will really make the animal look much bigger. So here we've got an example of a model that makes the uh, manta ray look giant because the manta ray is really close to my lens and the person is very small. It's generally good to position the model sort of diagonal opposite of your main subject. That gives it a nice balance. And if you're putting it into the negative space that we talked about earlier, then that fills that negative space and gives it a sense of depth. And that's what essentially makes it a three-dimensional picture. So putting the uh, diver into the diagonal, so into the negative space, diagonal opposite of your subject gives the picture a good balance and a good depth of field. And so that is a very useful way to place your um, model. 
Um, the body position I already mentioned earlier is very important. So um, having both legs visible is important. You can see there's two fins there. And in my uh, uh, ADEX talk, you, I have lots of examples of one-legged divers and no-legged divers and all these kind of things. So I'm not going to go into detail today, but it's important that you show both fins uh, in a picture. Otherwise, it looks really weird. Also, it's important that you're not in the middle of frog kicking. Otherwise, it looks a little bit like uh, you're doing a number two there in your wetsuit. So uh, make sure um, you don't uh, uh, frog kick or wait until the model stops the frog kick because it just looks really dumb. Um, another one is very important is bubbles. I know we all learn not to blow bubbles, but as a model, you have to control that. The way to do that is to do a very, very long, very, very thin air intake. So you just go like, a really, really long intake, and then you would wait and release the burst. Oh, I thought I had a picture for that. And then you release all the bubbles in one burst, and then the bubbles travel up in one block while you're breathing in slowly again. And that is how we can avoid horrible bubbles, like in this picture where I got a nice whale shark, a nice angled ice, everything, but in the back there's this bubble explosion right on the model. So when we get closer, then it gets uh, uh, more relevant also of what the subject does in terms of face. Um, there's obviously the holiday snap where the eyes are connecting with this, the, the camera, and uh, but the real thing, the better photo, the, the kind of thing that you can submit to competitions or magazines is when the person actually models. So here you can see Sarah from Girls at Scuba looking at the clownfish um, and making for a very nice uh, uh, modeled photo. You can, of course, look cool. This is my wife, Kate, um, with the Napoleon Racine Plow. And, you know, she can make a cool face looking at the subject. You know, it's very, very cool. Or you can make it very friendly. This is when you're interacting with the camera. Uh, this is Sarah once more, one more time. Uh, it's the same series of photos. Um, and when you're friendly, it doesn't really work. She's smiling. That looks pretty nice. But here, it just doesn't look very good for this lady. So in that case, it's important to just smile with your eyes. So have a friendly look on your uh, face without using your mouth. Now, um, here you can see a great picture of Ollie from Fathomless Life, um, who's a pro at smize, as Tyra Banks calls it. And that is a good approach for keeping uh, the face look nice. Another important thing, this is a picture of Gotham, who's I think here today, um, is the face should be facing the strobes so that there is a chance of the light coming in, lighting up the face. So um, even though you can see his eyes are looking towards the subject, which in this case is here, this, this uh, uh, um, plate uh, in the um, Jake seaplane in Palau, but his mask is still facing me, allowing my light to enter his mask so that the whole face is not dark. So that is another thing that's very useful um, to tell your buddies uh, that they would try to position themselves like that. Now here, uh, my friend Nina is doing a really good job at positioning herself behind the lionfish and the face is there and the light can travel in, but she's not looking at the subject. So that is a total no-no. That looks totally horrible. So make sure that the eyes are always on the subject. So um, all of this is a lot to take and not everybody uh, will know this. Uh, so make sure you brief your buddy who you're diving with about these things, body position, uh, the facial expression, mask, where you want them in to be in the picture, the whole story about the bubbles, and also if you use a torch, what kind of direction you want. The most important thing is that you discuss how your hand signals are. Um, in the ADEX talk, I talk about my signals, but for example, this here, are the fins. So if I go like this, then I want your fin direction to change or fin down or fin up or whatever. And lots of people are like, what, what is he trying to say? Are you like offending me or something? No, I'm just talking about your fins. And that's my signs and your signs might be different, but make sure you tell your buddy before, otherwise you're underwater getting all worked up because your model is not doing what um, you want them to do. All right, now I'm gonna talk a little bit about wide angle strobe. We did talk a lot about strobes already in session two. Um, and uh, we talked about the fringe light concept. Uh, we talked about uh, the triangle rule. That basically means the closer the subject is to the camera, the closer the strobe needs to be the, to the, uh, to the uh, sorry, the closer the animal is to your 
uh, lens, the closer the strobe should be to your lens. Um, and I'll show a little bit more about that in a moment. But that is something that we covered in session two. So please follow that if you didn't uh, see that yet. We talked about backscatter, so I'm going to skip through that as well. Um, but what we're talking about today is essentially the classic two-strobe setup in a wide-angle scenario when you're trying to cover a lot of ground. So here's your typical wide-angle scenario. This is the Seabream spawn in Palau, and you want to just light it up all evenly. So that's why you want the strobes to be far out, lighting all the animals equally in front of you. But if you then go closer and you still have your strobes set out, then you will get a shadow in the middle. That is because you're not following the triangle rule. So if your strobes are out, but the subject is here in the middle, the light basically lights up everything behind the subjects, but not the subjects in the front. And that is what we call close focus wide angle. That is when the subject is much, much closer, like this turtle. And that means you need to bring those strobes in. And that's what I mean with triangle rule. That means the closer the subject, in this case, the uh, turtle is practically kissing my dome, is another example of a cooperative subject. That animal was so not caring. It was literally there the whole time, wasn't even feeding, was just sitting there on top of the reef, wasn't hiding, wasn't swimming away. And me and Eduardo, who was diving with me, and a couple of others, we got all these really close-up photos because this animal was cooperative. It didn't mind us being there. Um, and you can see that I'm really, really close. So I would say the beak of the turtle is maybe this far away from my uh, fisheye dome. And the strobes are therefore very, very close because otherwise you would have a shadow on the face. So that's what I mean with triangle rule. This is a good example for a close focus uh, wide angle picture. So make sure you pull those strobes in uh, when you get close. But now I'm going to talk about um, some things that I haven't mentioned yet, which is bunny earring. So um, Alex Mustard calls the, I think he was the one who coined it, bunny earring. That's basically when the strobes are not on the side, but they're up. And up has a lot of advantages for certain situations. And one is a half up, which is sort of like a, uh, an I call it angled approach, but you could also call it like a cheerleader approach if you like. But one strobe is up and one is left, yeah? Uh, or both are up, which is the classic bunny earring. So I'll talk about the classic bunny earring first. That's when both strobes are above. And it is particularly useful for, for uh, rec photography because if you have your strobes on the outside close to the wall, the light will rebound a lot. And that's not what you want. So when you want to create reach, as in shine up the whole area inside the rec, putting the strobes up, okay, so this is a portrait shot, but essentially both strobes are up. You can see that we're lighting all the way in the back and we actually see all the way to the back wall by putting the strobes up. But it is also useful for situations like here, this bump head parrotfish spawn. When you wanna create distance, when you want your light to travel, then putting strobes up allows you to minimize backscatter and actually create more light on the subject. So these animals are not that close. And so when I shoot these spawns, I generally put my strobes a little bit higher. And I sometimes even take the diffuser caps off so that we have a lot of forward beam. But by putting them up, I avoid getting backscatter between me and the animals. So it's another useful approach for shooting animals that are far away with this bunny ear approach. And here is another example of the sharks that are pretty far away and they still get some light from my strobes because they're maybe not all the way up, but they're slightly up in this shot. When you have a reef, it is very important that you do this angled approach, right? So this uh, cheerleader approach, if you will. So putting one strobe up and one out has the advantage that you're not getting a hot light up of the left side of the picture in this case. So you can see here that we've got a turtle and a reef. Now, if I had the strobes in a classic forward position, then on the left here, you would see that the coral would be super lit up and the uh, and more lit up than the turtle and the diver. By putting the strobes out like that, I am getting actually the optimal light onto both the subject and the animal. And so you can also call this a 12-3 and a 12-9 position, that's by the clock. And so this is this sign that I'm using here. That's the clock on you know, the settings of the, uh, the indicators on the clock. Um, it's essentially a way of surface lighting that we discussed in session two, which is essentially thinking about where do I want that light to, to land 
um, in order to get the perfect effect. And essentially, the angled bunny ear approach is the same thing. Um, here, you can probably have the side of the reef, and we've got all these fish. So by putting the strobes slightly out to the side, I'm putting the light from the side onto uh, my subject because I'm looking at this surface. So essentially, this helps me light up what I want to light up and not light up um, you know, what is uh, closer to me. That brings me to top lighting that I find very important. So here you've got that crocodile, that cooperative guy. You can see it was just so so didn't care. Uh, so we did all kinds of things. You can see the front of this probably three to four meter croc is probably only a few centimeters away from my dome. And then I had, you know, because he didn't, he let me. So I kept taking photos. And in the end, I ended up with this sort of slight top lighting, bunny earring top lighting position, allowing me to create this great texture on the top of the nose of the crocodile, uh, which I believe there's not many photos like that. But that's essentially with top lighting. So both strobes up, despite the camera being in portrait, the strobes are up like this, lighting from the top. Um, this is another classic taking pictures of stingrays. If you don't put the strobes up, then you will not get a good effect. So this is another situation where you want to use bunny ear approach. Or here we've got another uh, situation where the lighting from the top just works much better for us. Uh, stingrays, whiptail rays, all of these guys are better when you light them from the top. And as a final little trick, you can also spotlight. So if you just take one strobe and you cover part of it, so with one hand, you can make a bit of a cover and then you can even create a spotlight. This is a wide angle shot, but of a very, very small painted frogfish. And so what I did is I held my hand in front of the strobe, just letting a little bit of light in. So I'm doing a top light spotlight, if you will, um, by covering part uh, of the strobe with my hand. So these were a couple of tips for wide angle lighting, special stuff. Keep the triangle rule in mind. It's super important uh, in wide angle. Uh, think about the close focus wide angle. So when you're close, bring in the strobes um, and play with these bunny ears. I feel that lots of people just shoot forward all the time. Um, just try to start practicing, bringing those strobes up and moving them above the photo uh, camera, uh, allowing you to create more interesting effects. And that brings me to vertical, something that I feel like is totally underused. I know lots of people who never, ever take any verticals. Uh, verticals is when we turn the camera sideways. And I would say out of what I'm observing, I would say 80 to 90% of people never use take underwater verticals. And that's a huge, huge loss because in a vertical, you allow uh, yourself to actually capture a, uh, a layered story that goes up and down most of our photos are always sideways, which means we have to kind of place the story elements right and left. But by going vertical, we can take the depth that we have underwater and create that. Like this clownfish here in, um, this was in Yap, um, you have clownfish, reef, and sunburst all in one picture. And that is because it's a vertical. And if that didn't convince you, think about your uh, Instagrams and your story on Facebook and your stories on Instagram. That's all portrait. So um, if you're keen on doing that, um, then you know your verticals are going to help you quite a lot. It also helps you capture certain situations like uh, large animals. As you would always say, whale sharks have to always be shot like that. Well, what if they start feeding? Well, then it needs to be a vertical shot. Otherwise, you can't get the whole animal in. It's good for portraits. I really love this picture of the blue grouper in uh, uh, this uh, in uh, Victoria. Oh no, this is in uh, close to S uh, Sydney actually, so uh, New South Wales, um, and it just works so good as a portrait rather than uh, a, a horizontal photo because that really fills the picture with this cool, super cute animal. Also, very cooperative animal this one, um, and uh, just makes for a much better portrait. Um, it also allows to capture elegance. I found this picture of uh, a manatee swimming in blue water uh, in Eshkalak, Mexico. Really, really great uh, to just shoot it in a, in a vertical instead, where you have the bottom, the animal, and the surface all in one picture. Or these uh, manta rays uh, feeding under the boat in the Maldives just look so much better when we've got a lot of that beautiful uh, 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 surface in the picture. 
So when you do strobe, most people tend to just turn the camera sideways. As you can see, this guy here in the picture is just turning the camera sideways. And you can already see in this photo, I'm also doing the same thing. Um, and you can see what the problem is. You very get a very sort of bottom lighting to the degree that it really ruins the image. You can see here that the top of this, this uh, coral has no uh, strobe lighting, only natural light, and the bottom has only uh, uh, strobe light. So it just looks really bad when you just turn the camera sideways. So there are situations where you can do that, but if you do do that, you need to reduce your 12, uh, you need to increase your 12 and reduce your 6. So essentially, the top strobe must, must be stronger and the bottom strobe must be weaker because the bottom part is usually closer to you. Unless, of course, the top part is closer to your strobe, then you have to turn that around. But essentially, if you're going to turn it around, you're going to have to fine tune the up and the down. And all you're going to be able to do is light up something that is like this uh, uh, um, sponge, kind of a vertical form. If you want to get it more interestingly lit up, though, what you need to do is you need to put them into the position that as they would be in wide angle. So although you're turning the camera sideways, you need to bring those strobes right and left. So essentially, this is what this looks like. This is my friend Markus Roth, very good photographer as well, taking a picture of the photo that I took, that I took myself later. Um, and essentially, what you do is you turn the camera sideways and you bring the strobes into a right and left position. So you're back into a, uh, a three to nine uh, position, if you think clockwise, but the camera is turned. And that's no problem. You can see me here in a wide angle situation with my setup, there's a picture by Jeff. Um, and you can see that the strobes are right and left of my dome, but it looks weird when I turn it back into normal position, but that doesn't matter. I am just swimming around with the setup like that, and I take my photos in this vertical position. So um, you can take a lot better photos in vertical if you have the strobes on both sides, because now we're lighting up the reef in the nice equal way, although we are in a vertical position. So also these sharks, you can see that the nose of the sharks lit up from both sides. That's because I'm in this uh, vertical position. So just remember guys, this is a great opportunity to, to, to spice up your photos. Just go into vertical, set the strobes into the right position where it needs to be. So even if you have a compact camera, put it sideways and put the strobe sideways, for example, and just take photos like this. Keep shooting in that, try to do different angles uh, and uh, see how you can capture different elements and portraits in that position. So when we are at verticals, let me take a sip of water. Oh, sorry, I actually didn't answer Thomas's photo earlier, uh, a question earlier um, about the uh, position of the strobe. I'm sorry. Oops. What's happening? I'll just go back because I missed answering his uh, photo, his photo, his question. So you asked me how I took the photo of the Napoleon Ras, what my uh, settings uh, were, and essentially it is the triangle rule. My picture, my strobes were pretty close to me. So really go far back so I forgot to answer your question. Here is a similar example. You can see the Napoleon was pretty close to me and the turtle was also pretty close to me. So I actually keep my clamps of my um, uh, of my arms relatively not loose but in a way that I can keep adjusting. So when the animal starts coming closer I usually just push the strobes in a little bit so I'm quickly ready for taking a photo. So with the Napoleon, when he started coming closer towards me, I would, I think, I can't quite remember, but I think I just pushed those strobes in because if the animal comes really close and you have the strobes out wide, then you actually don't light the middle and then you don't get the, uh, the, uh, the animal properly lit up. Hope that answered your question. Just gonna go back here to where we were. Uh, Thomas, no, not at full power, because if the subject is close and you're closer to the subject, then you're actually, what am I doing here, actually? 
um, when you're shooting at full power and you're very close, you are actually going to burn out your subject. Um, so when uh, the animal gets closer, you have to reduce the firepower um, because the uh, closer the animal goes, comes, the, the less water the strobe has to travel through. And we say by halving the distance of the animal towards the camera, you also have to half the power of the strobe. Otherwise, you're going to burn the subject. Uh, with your strobes. So uh, no, it wasn't full power. I don't remember exactly uh, what I was, but generally um, I do have on my strobe two settings. So on the Inons, that's what I really like about the Inon Z330s. They have a full power setup and then the manual setup. So I shoot in manual and if I need to shoot quickly into full power, I put, I just switch it into the full power mode and back if I need to. So I have two settings set that I can quickly switch around. Okay, so I was at verticals and that brings me to splits. Um, splits is a very popular yet not that easy topic. Um, so I did want to cover this. This is one of my favorite photos um, that I ever took in uh, South Africa. Um, and it was a lucky shot. Everything worked out perfectly, but I actually didn't know what I was doing. It was the first time I was using an SLR. It was almost the first dive I was using an SLR. And it was a lucky shot and I've very rarely gotten such good photos again because it requires a lot of effort and is not that easy. This is a nice one of my wife Kate in the Maldives. Uh, we, you know, we saw from the resort that there's these baby sharks there and so we spent quite a lot of time trying to take a, a, a photo. Um, Roman, I'll get to the exposures in a moment. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's a great way to capture a lot of information. We've got here sandy uh, bottom, we've got baby shark, we've got a resort in the back, we've got great sun and palm trees, um, uh, and we've got my wife in there. Um, so it's a lot of story elements that allow you to be captured if you do split photography. Here's another one, an example of a picture that I took in Guam of the manta rays. So I've got here manta rays in a group. Uh, uh, I've got the rainbow in the background. I've got, you know, the land mass and houses. It's a lot of elements that you, of course, can only do if you have uh, a lot of stuff into, um, uh, into one picture. Um, and now there's two versions. Uh, on the left, you've got uh, what you would say the classic horizontal. And on the right, you've got the verticals. And what I'm trying to tell you here is that you should actually practice with verticals. Because to take a really good horizontal, like this one, this is one of the best uh, split shots that I've ever seen, many, many awards won. This is by Matty Smith, who's also from uh, East Australia. And uh, this is an amazing photo. And if you look at it, you can already see that this baby turtle is actually putting is flipper on the dome, yeah? Still, the distance of the animal to the camera is still pretty reasonable. That is because Matty has designed his own domes. These are super large 12-inch uh, domes. I think they're 12-inch, uh, which you can buy from him. You can get them for every make of your camera. Um, and this is how you take perfect uh, split shots in a horizontal mode. Um, so the larger the dome, the easier it is to actually get that waterline to be in the middle of your picture. Now, it's easier to get that line if you're in a vertical because now you've got more up and down game. So unless you've got one of these big domes, I have a nine inch dome that I use. So if I do, so if I take wide angle photography uh, and I'm planning on doing lots of splits, then I'm using my nine inch dome. You can see it's pretty large, but it is also pretty bulky. It's very deep. So it's of course not as big as Matty's here, but you can see that it is pretty uh, large. But what I'm saying to you is even with a mini dome, you can take split shots. It's a bit harder, but if you do it in a horizontal way, you're doing yourself a favor because in a horizontal way, you are essentially allowing more space for that waterline for you. So that's why I would suggest always to start with um, the uh, vertical approach. 
With the vertical, you now have much more game for the waterline. It's easier to start with and it works with smaller domes. Uh, the only thing that you need to uh, plan is arranging your strobes. And actually in this picture, where you can see Matty Smith here with his dome, you can see that um, the strobes are both below the waterline. And that is very crucial, and I'll come to that in a bit, in a moment. One thing that's very important is you prepare your dome, and you have to keep preparing it. So um, you can see on this one, I didn't do a very good job. You can see there's sparkles there, um, there's water smudges there, um, there, uh, you know, the, the, there's uh, uh, sort of streaks uh, of sunlight that are not supposed to be there. That is because um, I didn't properly treat my dome very well. If you look here, this is a zoom in, people maybe wouldn't notice otherwise. But if you look at here, all the trees are actually messed up with uh, smudges of water. So um, the easiest way is when you're there is just to spit on the dome and, you know, same like your mask, reapply spit on a regular basis. Some people take shampoo, obviously should be reef friendly shampoo or detergent and just keep a little bottle of that, stick it in your wetsuit and reapply um, to get it very clean. You can also buy, uh, there's uh, Dr. Film for example and some others which you can buy that you can spray and they will last a bit longer. Um, so that allows you to keep a clean dome. I mostly just use spit which is organic and doesn't harm any reefs but uh, essentially um, it is uh, easier if you use chemical products. Now, when we come to the settings, it is super important that you think about what you're actually lighting up. So here, um, these are some pictures I took in Chuk um, on a, um, a dive with some sharks. Actually, I was on the boat already, and we just uh, threw some leftover chum in the water. Um, and you have to be very, very careful that you make sure you focus on the animals below the waterline. Because if you focus on what's above the water, then your animals below the water are going to be not sharp. So you have to set the focus below the waterline to make sure that the animals are definitely sharp. And in order to um, in order to have not too fuzzy uh, top side part of your picture, you want to have a relatively high aperture. Unless you want to go for something a bit more fuzzy, like here, um, and then you can choose a bit wider aperture. But another thing that's very important is that you choose the aperture and the shutter speed just right, so that the top is just not overexposed and the bottom is not too dark. Because what happens very often is that you either expose for the top, and then the top is nicely lit, but below water is way too dark, or you do the opposite and the top is burnt out. So generally, I would always go, particularly if you've got a better camera, a full frame camera, or a newer camera that has a, a wide dynamic range, is that you set your camera with the top, because it's very easy to burn your sky. As you can see here in this picture, my uh, sun is a bit too strong, so I did expose it a bit too much, um, and the bottom I could probably still fix. So you need to play with that, making sure that you've got just the right setting. So here in the Maldives on the, on the night dive, you can see that the light underwater is actually quite strong because these lights are right, right there. But the uh, people at the top are quite hard to get. So you can see there's quite a lot of ISO noise. Um, that's because I needed to expose it a little bit more to get them, but then I've got these lights in the way. So I did what I could. Um, and I still got a pretty reasonable result. You can see the people taking photos so you can recognize them, but that's as good as I could get it because of these straight lights. But if I would have exposed it um, so that I could see the people, then all these lamps would be completely burnt. So you have to really play with that, make sure you got it right. And once you got it, you have to shoot a lot, like take a lot of photos because it's the waterline is dancing through your picture and most of your pictures are gonna be ruined because the, the water is too high or too low or whatever. So these pictures are results of lots and lots and lots of photos. I don't know, I took hundreds of photos of this. This was in Yap, uh, Micronesia. I took so many photos of these sharks and only a few turned out really, really well. So um, you're gonna be ready to take lots and lots of photos and it, that makes your life easier if you've got a fast focusing camera with a compact, it's a lot harder to take photos like that. Um, what I mentioned earlier, the strobes need to be both below the waterline, very important. So we have them again in this 
interesting setup where we have the camera in vertical and both strobes on the side, but now they're not actually nine to three. I should have written there kind of seven five because they're below the waterline. So this is actually the wrong indicator. I'm going to change that for future presentations. But the important thing is that they're both underwater in order to um, actually light up what's below the water. That is what we usually want to achieve. So the sharks and all these, we usually want to light up below the water. However, there are situations where we need to light up the top. So this is a very rare situation. This is Chandler Cave in Palau. And uh, here we do need to light up the top. And so I've done this a few times. I've done this uh, with trees and some boats and people being on boats. So you can put one strobe out of the water. You have to clamp it really hard because now gravity is in full force. But you can actually put the camera in a way where you put one strobe below that's lighting up everything that's below the waterline and one strobe above that lights up everything that's above. And that worked really well here in, in this the last chamber of Chandler's Cave. And you can see I'm actually managed here to light up not only the bottom, and uh, this is uh, Simon Shivers here in the picture, but also all the way back there to the stalactites uh, uh, that are all lit up with my one strobe. And the other strobe is lighting up almost clean the entire surface of the cave. So this is an exception where you would light up both the top and the bottom. It's generally uh, not easy to do if you don't have calm waters. Uh, if you've got one of Maddie's super domes, sure, then uh, you know it's it's possible. But even then, it's quite difficult to take a photo like that unless you've got calm water. So generally, you want to have a situation where the water is very very calm and you are the one creating the fake waves. So in this situation, it was actually totally flat, but I actually created a bit of motion. So by moving the camera, you can create a you know, a, a fake wave, and but it's in control. And it ended up really well because one of the divers is just in one of the higher parts of the wave, which is what, you know, is a good result, um, is what I wanted. I wanted to cover how these people were, um, you know, doing this reef checking in in, um, in Chuk, and, uh, and that's the photo that we then later used for, for printing. Another thing that's super important is Whatever exposure you set, Roman asked me earlier, what is the um, exposure? Uh, you have to set the exposure to making sure that the top is not overexposed and the bottom is not underexposed. But the good news is you can do this all in Lightroom. This is where Lightroom is super, super useful. Um, so in this picture, you can see that I can see the bottom of the wreck. This is in Sri Lanka. You can see the bottom of the wreck is, is nicely visible, not clear. We didn't have great visibility. And the top is also quite nice. Mm -hmm. The original was, however, like this. So it wasn't actually that good sunlight and I actually had it relatively dark, but that's because I know that my camera has a lot of dynamic range. And then we set two gradient filters that we apply to the top, one to the top, where we you know, put a lot of saturation on the top, brightness, etc. Uh, uh, sorry, darkness, and in the bottom, we brighten everything up with a gradient filter. So you do put two gradient filters that meet uh, basically somewhere in the middle where the water is, and then you fixed your split photo very, very quickly. And the good news is you can copy paste those settings and put them onto your entire series of split shots. All you need to do is adjust where these um, gradient filters are uh, in order to have them in the right part. And uh, if this is new to you, then uh, I've got, you know, a four-part Lightroom series that you can watch on our uh, Insider Divers channel, where I'm taking you all the way through to these uh, uh, gradients. So um, uh, I don't remember which part of the series was about these uh, gradients, but if you follow that um, a series of Lightroom, you will eventually be able to use that. And it's very quick, so I can fix those uh, splits extremely quickly um, um, it's literally uh, less than a minute and you've got your whole split photo fixed up. So that's uh, what I wanted to share on uh, split photography. Um, uh, essentially, the bigger the dome, the better, but not everybody can afford or can travel with such a big dome. So um, whatever dome you have, make sure you prepare it. Or if you don't have anything with you, then spit on it before you start taking the pictures. Uh, one thing I also would like to mention, it's not easy to take split photography with uh, a, a, a wing. So if you have a 
uh, wing BCD is not easy because it will always push you forward and backwards. So if you plan on taking split shots, a lot of split shots is better. If you take a vest, you just rent one maybe from the operator if you don't have one, but it makes it easier to stay in the water and also take a snorkel because if you breathe through your regulator, you keep blowing bubbles, which create uh, ripples on the surface that you don't want. So you want to try and have a snorkel that allows you uh, to breathe from it. I never dive with a snorkel unless I'm teaching or taking split photos. So uh, it's useful to travel with one so that you have it when you take split photography. Aside from that, high aperture, make sure the focus is below the waterline, the strobes are below the waterline, and once you've got yourself set up, just shoot a lot of pictures because essentially that is what it takes to take good photos uh, in split photography is if you just take a lot of them and then finally you can pick the right ones in Lightroom and edit them real quickly. So now we come to sunburst. Gee, time really flies. I put in again way too much. So I'm sorry I'm reached uh, um, uh, nine o'clock already, but I'm going to do the next two real quickly. So how to capture sunburst. Sunburst is super, super useful to make a, a picture really interesting and also fresh. Um, you can, uh, I consider sunburst anything where the sun is in the picture creating an effect. Here we've got a, a, a wreck where the sun is right behind creating this nice halo. That's also a sunburst in my book. Um, we basically have either a direct sunburst, so you can see here on the left, the, uh, the manta ray is there, but the sunburst is on the left. Uh, and on the right, we've got a whale shark where the sun is behind. Uh, both of these, you have to treat them a little bit differently. Um, if you have a direct sunburst, that means the sun is shining directly into your camera. And that leads to a burn really, really quickly. So you have to really reduce your camera brightness quite strongly with your aperture and shutter speed and ISO to make sure that you don't have any burns of sun. Also, the rays look best when you use fast shutter speed because then uh, the motion of the waves creates these sunbursts. If you take it with a long uh, with a uh, with a long shutter speed, then they will move and they will disappear. So if you have a fast shutter speed, it's much better than uh, to capture uh, the sun rays. Also, if you're shooting against the sun and you've reduced the brightness of everything really, uh, uh, really intensively, your strobes are also not going to reach the subject much. So generally, with all uh, sunburst photography, if you want to use your strobes, you need to go into full power. Otherwise, you're not going to get any light on the subject. So here are examples of shooting against the sunlight. And I can tell you that this is either almost full or fully uh, uh, turned up uh, strobes. Otherwise, you wouldn't light anything up. So if you're going into sunburst mode, just do yourself the favor, reduce the camera right away before you even get into position, put your ISO to 100, put your aperture up, uh, you know, if it's a system camera like 15 or something, and if it's a compact camera, go all the way to 11 and also keep your aperture small. Um, uh, uh, sorry, keep your aperture, that would be aperture value. So apertures, you know, high aperture values above 10, and shutter speed, sort of 200, 250. Go in with that and just look at the shutters, uh, the the sunburst, and see how bright it is. If it is too bright, then uh, reduce further and have the strobes in full power. An easy time to take such photos is during sunset. This was in Komodo the, uh, last year. Um, if you are in sunset, it's much easier to take such photos. You just set your camera, you do your test shots against your hand, and then you can follow the subject and take really, really nice photos like this, right? So you take your test shots here, test, test, test. This is just taking the test shots on the reef. And then I come in onto this scorpion fish really, really close, again, really, really close to my uh, dome, and then light up um, this animal with the nice sun rays in the back. So uh, make sure you take a lot of test shots uh, for that. Um, if you have the blocked approach where you actually have the animal eventually blocking, that's when you get the really nice sunburst like this turtle in Sipadan. Um, you have to plan for that. You have to assume that at the moment the animal's not there yet, but it will be there eventually. And you have to set your camera for that. So here I tried to do that. You can see I took the photo too early. Um, and so the sun is actually burning the picture because it is too bright. So it's very easy. This approach is very, very easy to have shitty pictures uh, because the animal has to swim right between you 
and the sun in order to create that effect. So here you can see I failed with that. Um, so what you need to do is you need to uh, have it a bit wider than in a direct sunlight uh, approach. And your test photos are all going to look crap. So this is the turtle shot from earlier. You can see I've got a total sunburn here. But once I got close and the animal actually fully covered the sun, I got this really, really nice shot um, uh, with the sunburst as you want it. So when you are going for this blocked approach, you have to make sure that you choose your angle in advance. And when you're going to go for the sunburst with the blocked, like here, then stick with that. You have to set your camera. You can see my test shots were really, really crap because all I was looking at getting the sunlight right, then I waited until the shark actually passed me in the right angle. And that's how you get one of these sunburst photos. So doing that, you have to really commit to it and keep at this angle. Otherwise, you're not going to get the sunburst effect. Now, a good way to practice is if you use your buddies. You're always diving with your friends and they always like having cool photos of them with a nice halo behind their head. So practice on your buddies so that you are ready when you're taking photos of sharks. So make sure you make a decision if it's going to be direct or blocked and then stick with that. Don't mix up the two because they will make suboptimal results. Take lots and lots of test shots before you go into the situation so that you are ready for it. Practice the technique on your buddies. And as I mentioned, the easiest time to take such photos is during sunset. So make sure you practice at every sunset dive these sunbursts because it's a really nice effect in your photos and it's the easiest time to take those. Okay, last one, almost done. Thanks for staying uh, attentive. Is slow shutter speed. Slow shutter speed is a very difficult discipline. If you're a compact camera photographer, it's going to be really, really hard to take those photos. System cameras, much easier. The easiest is if you have a full frame with a fisheye is the easiest way to do. But you can do it with any system camera. So this was taken with an old Nikon. Um, also, this was uh, this is with my newer camera with the D850. But you can take such photos with all system cameras. With compacts, it's possible but not easy. The most important thing is that you have the shutter set to the right amount. So if you start in sort of 180, 160, 140, that is what I call mini uh, slow shutter. That's where you get just a little bit of a blur, which is quite nice. You can actually shoot a whole dive of wide angle with just that setting and what you get is a little bit of a motion blur not too much and it's quite interesting because it creates motion but it's not too extreme so it's a nice touch to take pictures of wide angle animals um, if you have the shutter speed sort of to a medium range so this is also 140th and what you get is a little bit of a blur around the animals which just shows you that there is speed it gives you this sense of the animals are moving rather than freezing, freezing, freezing the subject altogether. So uh, uh, just a, a really good idea um, to shoot in this sort of intermediate range, 140th to 180th, um, getting just a bit of a blur going. Then when you go to uh, sort of 125, then you already start to get a real proper blur. And here in this picture, you can see that the shadow of the animal precedes the animal. That is, uh, if you followed uh, the last section, uh, session four in macro photography, I talked about rear sync and second curtain. Um, I'm not going to explain it in all detail. Once I upload that uh, for you guys, then you can check that out. But essentially, that means when do I take the photo? Essentially, if you have a slow shutter speed, the animal moves while the camera is open. And the question is, if the strobe fires in the front, it's only a tiny fraction of a second that you have the strobe. So it's less long as the entire exposure. So the question is, do I expose at the beginning? Sorry, do I fire my strobe at the beginning or at the end? And rear sync or second curtain means that the animal travels and then you freeze the motion in the beginning. Uh, here's an example from uh, a website that I, uh, I stole. Uh, and here you can see that if I have the front curtain or a normal flash, you can see that it frees the beginning of the motion and then the rest is a blur. But if you want to create a, a, the feeling of forward motion, it's actually better if you do it opposite. So rear curtain sync is, is when you have exposure first and then the strobe. So that means you have to change your camera settings to the being at the back. And that's what we call in Nikon, we call it rear curtain uh, or rear sync. 
and in uh, Canon we call it second curtain. I think in Olympus they call it second curtain as well. Another example that I took from a website about front and rear. Right? So now you're set to rear sync. You can see that the motion blur is now behind the animal and now you can do all kinds of funny stuff. But um, a starting point is generally one twentieth. I think is a good starting point. And literally from one tenth to one twentieth is the best time to the best um, game where you can play with slow shutter. If you go shorter than uh, sorry longer than one tenth, then you start to need to actually fix your camera to get a good solid shot. So um, uh, the other thing is very important is that you have really strong strobe light. If you don't have the strobe at maximum power, you're not going to get the animal frozen. So you can see here, uh, the strobe is just really, really weak. So on the next round, I had the strobe really, really strong. And then we create the really, really nice effect with about 1 20th of a second and really strong strobe light. Here you get an effect of actually turning the camera. So this is 1 15th and the camera is being turned. It's a very interesting effect, not everybody likes it, but it's a fun thing and it's good to practice. When you're trying to get a grip with this technique, this is the way to practice. Just keep taking photos and move them sideways, creating these different kinds of photos, allowing you to see what creates a blur and what doesn't. Um, so here's one tenth, and you can see it starts getting difficult to actually freeze the motion uh, in the middle. You can see that even on the the top of the nurse shark, there's already kind of a motion there. So one tenth is already quite tough to uh, have this turning motion. But it's a great way of practicing how slow shutter works. So when you have the situation where you really want to use it, then you know how your camera and strobes need to be set. Another uh, fun technique is zooming. So that's basically releasing and zooming. So if you have a zoom dial, this was shot with a 10 to 17 uh, uh, Tokina lens on a D500. Um, and you're basically zooming while you're exposing. So you click and zoom, click and zoom, and essentially you get this sort of warp mode uh, effect um, that you know is quite creative and something new that you can play with. So in summary, for slow shutter, um, uh, make sure you have your camera set to rear or second curtain. Uh, if you want to just have the mild effect, do 1 30th to 1 80th. Um, and if you want to have a proper strong uh, slow shutter, I, I suggest to be 1 10th to 120 or 125. Um, and uh, make sure the strobe's really strong, otherwise it won't work. It's best with fisheye, so with the zoom lens, very difficult to achieve that effect because you have to get very close. If you're not close, you won't be able to freeze the motion with the strobe. So make sure that you have a fisheye on that allows you to get close. So if you're trying to do it with a compact, try to also do it with a fisheye adapter which allows you to just get the animals much, much closer, right? Take test shots with your hand. So when the animal, before the animal comes, I usually do something like this or like that, where I just take photos and I can practice how fast the animal would be moving and what the effect would be before the animal is, is there. And same like with split shot photography, make sure you keep shooting a lot. So that's what uh, I wanted to share with you today with quite a bit and we again uh, overshot uh, the hour. Sorry about that. Uh, but uh, thanks for joining that. We talked today about um, uh, the, you know, some thoughts about how you approach uh, in a wide angle photography uh, situation. Uh, we talked about verticals that uh, please try to shoot more verticals because that's really uh, going to make your photos more interesting. Uh, we talked about some specifics in lighting. You remember the bunny earring. Uh, also split photography, how to take ab above and below photos uh, and sunbursts as well as slow shutter. And with that, uh, I would like to ask if there are any further questions. Um, because this is actually the end of my uh, five-part photography series. Um, so I'm pretty much done now with everything that I wanted to share with a wider audience. For more detail, we would um, uh, essentially have to go into uh, smaller groups or on our trips. Um, so uh, let's hear, hear some questions and I'll tell you some more things that are coming up after that. So. Um, Okay, Michael is asking a good question about the uh, motion blur with uh, slow shutter. So essentially, I'll use this example that I took from a website where 
that um, is very well depicted with this little train. So if you look at the train here, you can see that the yellow light of the front light of the uh, train travels a certain distance. On the bottom part, you can see it very well. You can see it starts somewhere and it ends somewhere. That is how far the, the in this case, subject travels while the camera is open. So let's say the camera would be open for one second, yeah, and the uh, train would travel 10 centimeters. That means the train would be traveling with 10 centimeters per second, right? And that means while you take this photo, he will move from one part to the other. That is the lights that you see. They are being recorded in one tenth of a second. The, so that's why you get the light trail. But the strobe, the strobe light of your strobe is only one one thousandth of a second. So only for one milli millisecond, you get this one strong burst of light, but that burst of light only uh, happens at a certain time. So if you've got a whole second, but only one thousandth of that second, you've got the strobe, the rest of the time, you don't have this light exposure. So that's why you've got a frozen motion then, and everything else is just shot with ambient light. So therefore is not sharp. I hope that answered the question. It's very difficult to explain. I hope that answered the question, Michael. Another question I had here from Catherine is about the macro sessions. Uh, one macro session is online and the other macro session, unfortunately, uh, had a failed recording or something. So I have to re-record that and I will upload that a bit later and I will send a, an email to everybody um, that it is online. Um, I'm also going to mention that there's two talks with ADEX um, that I haven't uh, released yet. Uh, there's a rec talk that will be uh, shown by them uh, sometime this month, uh, so rec photography talk. Um, and there is another one that I did about three weeks ago for ADEX, uh, which was about the modeling, which is already online that you can find on the ADEX page. Uh, but once ADEX is over, I will upload both of those uh, as well, uh, but that will be, still be a bit of time away. I really like Karen's suggestion about uh, uh, work, uh, you know, about uh, photography in Hong Kong. Uh, Karen, I do uh, um, offer diving locally here with uh, Cycle Scuba, where I'm a partner, and uh, we also do photography days. So once a month, we do only photography. So we go out as a group and all we do is photography. Maybe you want to join us for that. Uh, you can message me. I can send you the details. I think the next one is end of, uh, end of July. And um, I'm also planning to do workshops here in Hong Kong now that we have the shop open. Uh, well, it's next week we will open the shop in Sai Kung and we will probably uh, open some workshops there. So there we can talk about uh, photography in Hong Kong. Are there any other questions, guys? If not, I'm just gonna mention real quickly, I've got a really hot talk this week by Dr. Mark Erdman, who's Vice President of Conservation or at Conservation International. He is going to talk about whale shark tagging in Indonesia, um, in, in Western uh, Papua primarily. And he has these amazing stories where they tag the whale sharks and they have a GPS tracker, but also depth trackers. So you will see where these whale sharks travel, where they, how far away they go, when they come back, what they do, how deep they dive, etc. All of this he's going to be talking about. It's a very high uh, uh, profile uh, scientist that's coming to us. So it'd be really great if you can come and also share this talk because it's it's really something special. We also have next week a really great photography talk for all of you guys who like wide angle photography. We have Alan Walker here, it was supposed to be last week, but he got called to the sardine run. So we're doing that next week. Um, so go and check this out as photography is amazing. Uh, so make sure you join next week, Thursday, uh, same time. Um, and he has like some of the best shark photography of, the, uh, of South Africa that he's gonna share with us also how he takes these photos. Uh, also, if you want to do one-on-one uh, -on -one sessions, I've done quite a few. Um, actually, Catherine, who's here, uh, I've already done a session with, and quite a few others. So um, if you have particular things, if you want to work on your portfolio, if you want to work on editing, if you have troubles getting into Lightroom or Photoshop, we can work that together. Or um, another one, Andrea um, contacted me and asked me if I could help him 
with uh, preparing him for the amateur category of a, an award, and he actually made it into the semifinals. We're still hoping that he actually got a prize. But essentially, we picked the photos together, we edited the photos together, uh, we did two sessions, so he spent some time uh, editing the photos, and it came back, and we finalized them, we submitted them together, and uh, yeah, he made it anyway to semifinals. So that kind of stuff we can do as well. Also, some people uh, want me to talk with them about their setup, like how to set up their strobes, or wire their strobes, or arms, or whatever. That's also all really easily done via Zoom, so if you're interested in that, message me. We can set up a talk like that. Um, I think Dasha is here in the, uh, Daria is here in the talk. We will have a session tomorrow. I haven't forgotten we're going to be looking at her portfolio tomorrow. So if you're interested in that, let me know. Also, if you want to uh, support my work, uh, if you've been uh, joining these talks uh, and if you've been enjoying them, you're welcome to drop a little tip on my donation page. Um, you can do as little as, I think, five bucks or ten bucks if you want to do that. That's great, um, helping me pay for the webinar fees. Um, uh, and, you know, as a, as a tip, if you like. Um, definitely, please uh, follow my Insider Divers YouTube channel, um, subscribe there, or share the videos from there. And also make sure you join our Insider Divers community because we share super interesting stuff. We also have the Insider Divers Academy Facebook group, which is all about photography. So uh, please join these um, and send me messages with questions if you have. Um, and yeah, with that, I'd like to say thank you. Oops, um, I would like to say thank you. Uh, for your attention. If there are no further questions, then I will wrap up the session right here. Any other questions? No. In that case, I will say thank you very much. Have a great uh, uh, day, great evening, great uh, rest of the day, wherever you are in the world. Stay safe, have fun diving, and take great photos and uh, share them. All right. Have a good one, and uh, I wish you guys all the best. Bye-bye.